All right, so we're all here for the third annual TEDx Records event. But did you guys also know that today is the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic? Today. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the excellent minds we have here today finds things we can still learn about that disaster. So he's a visiting scholar at Rutgers, a regular writer for the Atlantic, and a speaker at the TED 2011 conference. Please welcome Dr. Edward Tenner. of her loss 
endowed the world's greatest academic library, Widener Library at Harvard. And if you visit Widener today, you will see in the very center of Widener Library, the private library of Harry Elkins Widener. At the, at the very core of it, it really actually determined the whole construction of the building. So that's another influence of the Titanic. And then consider the hearings that were led by Senator Smith at the Waldorf Astoria shortly after the, Titanic, uh, the Titanic's survivors arrived in New York. That was not the first, but that was one of the most influential congressional hearings of the early 20th century, and that actually paved the way uh, both for the water makers, but before that, of course, for, for Joe McCarthy. So we, we never know really what results a precedent is going to bring. Uh, and actually, the Titanic is an industry in its own right. If you look at the cost of building the Titanic and the income later derived from films and books about the Titanic, the Titanic may have been the most profitable ship ever built. Uh, sadly, not for the builders or for the, uh, for the passengers, but it still just shows how, how impact of an event can echo over the years. When we talk about unintended consequences, we're also talking about who was to blame for the Titanic. And here's something we can also learn. We have two interpretations of following the popular indignation over the scene. The public wanted answers. So there were two sets of hearings. And they aimed at two different interpretations. One I would call a populist wedding cake model, that this was all a conspiracy of the rich, that they were foolish, they were short-sighted, uh, the poor were doomed. Uh, the other was what a later analysts called the Swiss cheese model. And in the Swiss cheese model, you have precautions, a set of precautions, and usually one of them will keep you from disaster. But sometimes, just as you might have a piece of Swiss cheese that has a hole that runs all the way through, but most of the time the holes are confined to some slices. Sometimes you just happen to have something that goes wrong in one detail after another. If one of these safety measures had been successful, the disaster would have been averted. So the debate about the Titanic has always followed that division. Uh, we have, for example, Senator William Smith, who led the American hearings, and Lord Mercy, who was in charge of the British hearings. Senator Smith reached the position that there was gross negligence. Lord Mercy said, look, we know now that people acted foolishly. We know that they should have gone more slowly. But all the captains were going at full speed through ice fields. I'll explain why a bit later. So even though, in hindsight, this was a really tragic event, uh, and we have to do things differently in the future, we really can't blame people too severely for what happened then. And the debate continues today. Uh, David Cameron, uh, the filmmaker, really represents uh, Senator Smith's point of view in underscoring the villainy of the upper class and the cluelessness of the people who built and ran the Titanic. Uh, Mark Stein, the conservative columnist, says no, the whole point of the Titanic was that it showed just how chivalrous how noble the upper classes were, and look at these post Concordia people, they had no class at all. So we have the debate then that continues in just about the same way uh, even today. And I think there is, there is some point on, on, uh, on both sides, but I'm, I'm going to argue a little bit in favor of the White Star Line. Uh, and even in favor of Bruce Ismay, whom I have shown in red here, Ismay is often portrayed as the villain. He's often portrayed falsely as the man who was trying to get the Titanic to set a speed record. Uh, really, nothing of the kind. He was also not really guilty of taking anybody's position in a lifeboat. But he has been blamed for that ever since. And I'm going to suggest what the real issue was. The real issue surprisingly, was not icebergs. It was fog. Uh, here is Captain Smith, who was a veteran. He was one of the most uh, distinguished people in the uh, White Star Line. He was known as a popular, very affable commander. 
And he really did not worry that much about icebergs. Of course, he did worry about them. It was a serious matter. But the fact was that collisions of ships with icebergs in the recent past had caused relatively little damage. What he did worry about, what all captains worried about terribly, was fog. Fog is the most dangerous form of life. If you've ever encountered it on the road, you know how harrowing it can be. You don't know whether you should slow down or keep your present speed. You don't know when you're going to be hit. And in fact, a few years before, there was a serious accident in which, in the fog, in which the White Star Line ship Republic had been hit by another ship. You can see the results to the ship that, uh, that hit the Republic. Uh, the Republic actually went down. There's still some debate about pressure on the Republic. And yet the Republic took hours and hours to sink. The Republic would be completely and safely evacuated by other ships in the area. So this was the mental world of people at the time of the Titanic's uh, first voyage. Uh, they, they, there was a fog chair on the bridge of most ships. The captain would sit in this special chair during the fog was a white knuckle, always a white knuckle event, and uh, the captain would not really leave the chair for uh, any but the shortest periods until the fog had lifted. That's how serious it was. So if you read, for example, an article published in March 1912, just before the Titanic sailed, safety of the ship, if you read newspaper articles from the time, what you will find is they were afraid, not of icebergs, but of fog and of hit by another ship in the fog. Now, what is the danger of construction? That's the second point about the Titanic. The Titanic was, was really a bigger version of a design that had appeared to be safe. And actually, there are precedents for this that go back to the Middle Ages. Uh, this is the Cathedral of St. Peter in Beauvais, uh, built in 1272, collapsed in 1284. This cathedral represented medieval engineering at its finest, enlightenment in the divine sense, admitting the greatest amount of light using flying buttresses, seating the greatest number of people. The problem was, though, that the builders, skilled though they were, did not really realize the peak wind gusts that would prevail in the Bow Bay area. So 12 years after the cathedral was built, uh, the choir, the part that you see there, collapsed. You can see I, I put in red arrows uh, the, the reinforcements that are still there today. And you can see that even now, the cathedral needs bracing. So even medieval designers really were striving to build bigger and bigger. And sometimes, really through no fault of their own, it happened that they stepped over a line. You can see this even in the early 20th century. Uh, the collapse of the Quebec Bridge inspired a new form of design, a lighter one, the uh, cable suspension bridge, and that was a, a terrible uh, collapse in the, in the 1950s. So that brings us to another element of safety. Uh, after the question of obstacles, after the question of lightness and structure and size, there's a matter of rescue. And the frequent blame that's attached to the White Star Line for not having enough lifeboats. When you look at the issue of lifeboats, it really becomes much more complex. Uh, this is the uh, photo taken from the Carpathia of some of the first Titanic uh, refugees arriving. But the issue with lifeboats is really that Lifeboats aren't free. Now, in the case of the Titanic, the reason for not having more lifeboats was not expense. It was the fact that the passengers themselves did not really want to have too many lifeboats around. The lifeboats obstructed their view, and it also reminded them of unpleasant risks that they, like the owners of the ship, liked to think were gone. But after the Titanic set, the ship owners would um, would want to install them voluntarily, and they actually helped sink the Eastland in Chicago Harbor, taking the lives of more passengers than died on the Titanic. Also, on the Lusitania, the ship sank in 
15 minutes in 1915. There wasn't enough time to evacuate. And on the Andrea Doria, uh, likewise, uh, lifeboats did allow people to evacuate, but another safety measure, radar, actually accelerated the, uh, the uh, problem. Now, if we look more recently, we see that there's a new ship design, the roll-on, roll-off ship, that introduced new problems. And one of the interesting things is that even though aviation has become safer and safer, new ship designs have brought new levels of death. For example, on the Estonia, which sank in, in 1994, uh, uh, 900, uh, uh, 900 people died. Uh, this, oh, pardon me, 500 people died. So there have been tragedies despite the lifeboats because if a ship is sinking rapidly, uh, as in the case of the Estonia, here's a life raft from the Estonia. If a ship is sinking rapidly, it doesn't matter how many lifeboats you have if people aren't able to reach them. So today there's a, a new interest in uh, making a ship survivable. Uh, this is another recent ship, the Costa Concordia. And you'll see that in this case, another form of safety technology, an advanced navigation system, created a new problem possibly because the underlying charts were not up to date. So if we put the White Star Line's failure in perspective, we can compare it with the Challenger, we can compare it with Chernobyl, we can compare it with the Gulf oil spill and Fukushima, and with recent collapses of cranes in New York. But there was a difference. The White Star Line was really a very high reliability organization. It was an excellent organization. The mistakes that it made were really mistakes that are inherent in all kinds of new technology and technological risk. So we, we should really talk, talk about the people who ran the White Star Line. We should really think about our own position and the limits of technological precautions. In 1977, for example, the greatest aviation accident ever on Tenerife, in which two 747s collided, uh, occurred under the auspices of one of Europe's most experienced pilots, again, by the way, in the fall. And what contributed to this tragedy was actually safety legislation, because the pilot was facing very serious penalties if he exceeded his flying time. And so he really got panicked, and he took off in a fog, and he did not clear another 747. And as in the case of Captain Smith, it was actually his experience and skill that worked against him, because he had such prestige that his subordinate officers really did not try to interrupt him. They, they, were, they were in awe of him. They were assuming that he knew what he was doing. Where does that leave us today? Well, let me look at the example in closing of surgery. In the 19th century, uh, as in the case of the clinic in Philadelphia. In the 19th century, surgery was done without antisepsis. There was a terrible death rate. But doctors were very seldom sued for malpractice. Only with the rise of scientific medicine, only when doctors were able to help people, did people start suing them for malpractice. And the reason is, according, this is another view of doctors. Uh, the, these are the leading figures of the French School of Medicine in the uh, in Sorbonne in, uh, in 1900 or so. And the reason is, according to legal theorists, that along with durable precautions, like lifeboats, you have non-durable precautions. All of the safety procedures that you have to follow, and the bigger and the more complex technology gets, the more procedures there are, the more things that can go wrong, the more you're responsible for. So it's a reminder to us that advanced technology has a lot of blessings. Enlightenment has a lot of blessings, but it also has a lot of burdens. So I'll close with two of my favorite quotes applicable to technology and certainly applicable to the, to, to the Titanic. The first is from Soren Kierkegaard. Life is lived forward, but understood backward. The second from Lewis Carroll. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. Thank you very much.
the terminal slope was a ship that uh, caught fire in New York Harbor and had over a thousand victims. They were uh, they were members of a German American community uh, on the east side of New York, and the Eastland in 1915 was uh, was actually chartered for a tour, uh, a, a cruise on Lake Michigan uh, for the uh, the. Uh, workers in a West Chicago telephone plant, Western Electric, and they also were a relatively close ethnic community. So what happens in those cases is that the social networks fold in on themselves. There aren't that many people in other cities and other places and other groups in New York who know somebody who were there. But the Titanic was almost unique uh, in having a full range of wealth and and uh, I won't say poverty because it took a certain amount of money to buy a ticket, but in having a, 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 a full a social and, uh, and ethnic diversity. Uh, and so uh, there was even a, 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 a French Haitian couple on, on board. So it was really a, a mirror of the Atlantic world <coughs> in, uh, in, in 1912. And, and so uh, nearly everybody knew somebody who knew somebody who was affected by it, and that really burned itself into public memory. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.